time you talk just a little bit about what you did this weekend. <laughs> I thought you knew this. My wife made me do it. I finger. You wouldn't dare do this to me. No, you know what? I'm glad. I'm happy to do it because we had an awesome weekend. We started uh, Friday night with a youth fest that we started here. It was, um, the whole message was about breakthrough. And the, whole, the whole weekend was about breakthrough. And Friday night, uh, we got a lot of responses on, on Facebook and stuff of people asking for prayer and different things. Some of them even, uh, text me privately, you know, private message and stuff. So, and then last night, or actually, take it back a bit, uh, yesterday afternoon, we had, for the younger kids, we had a, a big puppet show and, and different stuff. Um, my, my mom, uh, Ben Burr, took care of that for us and helped us out. And we appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, did a great job with the with the young kids. They really enjoyed it. And then last night uh, we had a blast. <laughs> we had all the kids in here. We we got a bunch of uh, volleyballs we, or beach balls, yeah. yeah, beach balls, and we just threw the beach balls out at the kids and stuff, and uh, just let them play all night and have fun, you know, while we were doing that. So known to them, this beach balls was part of the message. See, each ball had something written on it, you know, and uh, it's like rejection and different stuff like that, depression and stuff like that. And uh, and so it tied into the message and stuff, and we just had a big ball. By the end of it, we had about nine kids up here lined up that said that they wanted to rededicate their lives or give their lives to the first time. We also had an adult, too, that came in from the street. He had heard it because we had the windows, or the doors open in the back, and he came in. So he was also saved last night, too. So all together, 10 salvations. So we had a, a blessed weekend, to say the least. Sister Vandiver, thank you guys so much. Uh, God is is good. And before our summer message, I have to just speak a little bit about legacy. Uh, these two ladies right here, <laughs> I'm calling you out, Sister Vandiver, Sister Murphy, um, both big, big reason that your pastor's up here today. I'm so thankful for you two, and I'm so excited that you guys are here. Really, really am. Uh, I think more than half of our congregation is here because of result of some of your ministries. So thank you guys. Um, God is good. Amen. This is somebody's mask. That's mine. I might get COVID from that mask. I'm going to it up there. I don't have that disease. I don't want it again. So, God is so good. Um, we're going to start a series this week. We're starting a series I'm calling Guilty. Uh, Guilty is a series I've been working on for a long time. If you guys remember, at the beginning of February, I asked you guys to read through the book of John. John is my favorite, my favorite gospel. Because John, if you start and you go to Bible college and you learn all the technical words, you learn that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic gospels. And it's because they're very similar. They're the same. But John's different. And John wrote his his, his his story of Jesus a little differently than the rest of the three guys. John was a little closer to Jesus. He loved Jesus more than anyone. In fact, all through the book of John, John has a nickname. He doesn't call himself John, but he calls him the beloved or the one who Jesus loved. Like, well, the first time I read it as a teenager, I thought, this guy's cocky and arrogant. Walking around talking about, I'm the one he loved. <laughs> that sounds like something Billy would say. Well, uh, that's not. But that's not Billy. That, that that's not John. John actually was 
the one that was the closest to Jesus when you read the whole Bible, you get it and you understand why John called himself that. It was probably something Jesus was said, would have said, said himself, like, you're my favorite. Like, my mom always tells one of my kids, you're my favorite. I get angry about it, and then she reminds me that Jesus had a favorite too, so it's okay. But John might have been Jesus' favorite, but John's, John's view of the gospel is set up like a court case, actually. And John's court case, Jesus is on trial. And we see words throughout John's, throughout John's gospel that aren't in the other ones as many times. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all talk about legal disputes, trials, vindication before the divine judge. Each of them talk about how Jesus had lost his trial. How at his end he was arrested, tried by a Jewish council. And then by the Roman procurator, Pilate. Before being crucified by the Romans. Then each of them said he would be vindicated as the son of man in the divine courtroom. Now John, John talks about how Jesus, John stands out from the others because John says, John talks forensic language and themes and makes the notion of a divine courtroom with his metaphor of a lawsuit or trial in a cosmic scale. John talks about how Jesus said, Jesus said that he was going to send the Holy Spirit. John talks about, and he uses the, about how he was going to send the Holy Spirit. And in the Greek, he uses the word parakletos, paracle, or parakletosis, a legal term for an advocate, a counselor, a lawyer. I won't read it, but it's John 14, 26. So John talks about Jesus being, about Jesus sending the Holy Spirit. But the word he uses is, is our lawyer, our advocate, someone who stands up for us, our counsel, our best friend. But it's definitely, definitely a word that they would have used in the courtroom. John uses other, case, other court case terms such as this. More than three, he uses other other court terms more than the other three. For example, the noun witness or testimony occurs 14 times. 14 times in comparison with only four times through the other three Gospels. Together and the um, together and the verb to witness or to testify 33 times in comparison to twice in the other three, three synoptics. The verb to judge is employed 19 times in John, as opposed to six times in Matthew and six times in Luke. In the coming weeks, we're not going to go over the whole book of John, but what we're going to go through over is there are a whole bunch of people that John uses as witnesses that he calls to the stand, if you will. What we're going to do is we're going to talk about these witnesses and we're going to talk about our witness and our testimony how their, their, their testimony and their witness can change our lives, but ours can change others. Because that's it to me. That's what it's all about. It's not, we're always talking about how good God is to us. God is good, God is good, God is great, He blessed me. But what it's about is getting God to bless others. Getting more people in here so that God can bless them. Changing lives, changing people, changing our community, changing our culture. That's what it's really about. So we're going to dig through these testimonies in hopes that you see that you also have a testimony. The verb, so to me, what is so great about the Bible is that these people are not fairy tales, but they're real people. These people walked and talked with Jesus. They're real. They're not people like Jenny could come up here and Elliot would probably speak better than me. Billy speaks wonderfully. My dad does a great job. But they've heard the story from somewhere else. What we're going to talk about in the coming weeks are people who actually saw it themselves. 
They were there. They saw Jesus turn water into wine. And they saw Jesus walk on the water. They saw him feed the 5,000 with, with nothing. These people saw it. They're not telling a story. They're telling their life. So it means so much more when you see it from this perspective. They each have a story. And we will dive deep into them. And how they encounter. Their encounter with Jesus proves his deity. It kind of reminds me of Hebrews when you talk about how each of them had a story to tell. Hebrews 12 wants it. Therefore, since we are surrounded by great, by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So Hebrews says that we're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. There's a bunch of witnesses that, that, and they're all here, they're in the Bible, but there's witnesses all over the place who can tell this story and help us run our race. So let's start this court case. Jesus is brought into the courtroom. The bailiff announces, all stand. And the clerk declares, the people of Israel versus Jesus of Nazareth. The char and the charge a felony, a capital offense against the Mosaic law. He made himself to be the son of God. So the, court, so the, the clerk says that he's guilty of making himself to be the son of God. And that's, that's basically what he did. So we can find that in John 19, 7. The Jews answered him, we have a law, and according to that law, he ought, to, he ought to die because he has made himself the son of God. And John 5, 18 says this. It says, this was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So he's guilty of this. There is no doubt Jesus himself was guilty of what they were accusing him of. But was he right to do it? That's the question. Was he really, truly the son of God? All are seated in the trial. And the trial commences with the opening statements. The prosecuting attorney would be Satan. And Satan comes up. And he elegantly speaks. How many know that Satan, Satan, we all think of him as like this snake whispering in our ear. But sometimes what he has to say sounds really, really good. It sounds right. <laughs> I always tell you guys, this is one of my favorite terms. We have, we have to decide whether or not it's good or God. And sometimes things look really, really good on our fleshly side, but that doesn't mean it's God. So Satan comes up and he elegantly speaks here. He speaks his opening statements. His opening statements. This man, Jesus claims that he is the Messiah. He's a, he's a fraud. Many others have claimed to be the Messiah before him. This happens all the time. The claims are always empty. This man, Jesus, he claimed, this man, Jesus, his claims are completely groundless. He's just a simple carpenter from Nazareth. He has no theological training. So how many of you guys know that Jesus likes to tell you that you're a nobody? That you ain't got no talents? And you're just a gangster thug from South Phoenix? You're just a white boy basketball player who sat on the bench? You're just a... Or Billy, you ain't nothing without Shannon. The devil tries to tell you that. No, that is not true. <laughs> You're not supposed to say that, Billy. The devil likes to tell you that. But he likes to tell us that so much because when he makes us feel like nothing, then God gets nothing from us. When he makes you feel like nothing, God gets nothing from us. He wants to tell you that your relationship won't last, that your dreams are unattainable, that everyone wants the same, everyone wants the same thing, and very few get it. He likes to tell you that. Everyone wants to be the, the whatever you want to be. Everyone wants to be it, but nobody gets it. If it was easy, if some nobody like you could get it, then everyone would do it. And that's 
But our Lord Jesus suffered too. He was just a carpenter, a nobody. And Satan told him the same lies that he tells you over and over and over again. And I believe that it was a court case and he was giving his opening statements. That's exactly what he would start with. So, I'm sorry, that was me. I interrupted Satan's opening remarks to tell you guys that. He claims to have, so here's Satan, let's go on. He claims to have more status and authority than our teacher Moses. His associates with low life centers. He's a rabbi rouser, a troublemaker. He incites the people to revolt. He's an insurrectionist. He is a threat to the Jews and a menace to the Romans. He has deceived so many simple folks. He's not what he claims to be. For all the confusion that he has caused and harm that he has done, he ought to be found guilty, condemned, and put to death. This is another thing that Satan likes to do. Satan likes to bring up our past. He likes to bring up our failures. He likes to make us feel guilty and ashamed. He tells you what you did wrong. Over and over and over again. And you know that maybe you just did it once. Maybe you just did it twice. But Satan makes you feel like you did it a thousand times. And you know that was before you came to Christ. But Satan makes you feel like, like you're still the same old person. But what's the Bible tell us? We're a new person yes. in Christ. We are different than we were before. And we have to remind ourselves of that over and and over and over again. That's what Satan does. Satan tries to remind us. You are forgiven. You are loved. You are free from all the sin. Because Jesus is exactly. Who Satan is trying to tell you he's not. Jesus is all that. He is like. I think. Uh, Mr. Clean has a thing called the magic eraser. I think uh, that could be Jesus' nickname, right? The magic eraser. He just erases it all. Much more, by the way, that magic eraser don't work like Jesus. It doesn't. I bought it, and I'm not getting paid by anyone to say that, but don't try it. So, so that magic eraser doesn't work. But Jesus tries, but the devil tries to lie to us, and we need to remember that we are forgiven and we are loved. The, the coolest thing to me, though, is, is, your, is you... I'm sorry. Your problems, your insurrections, the things that Satan continuously whispers in your ear, Jesus had them too. Satan whispered the same stuff in Jesus' ear. That's so cool. And the next thing that is so cool about it is those things that you're guilty of, that you're ashamed of, when you start telling them, that's when you change people's lives. When people can see where you came from and where you are now, and they see the change in your life, that's what makes a difference. Don't be ashamed of your past. You tell people what Jesus brought you out of. Because yeah. that not that not only tells that doesn't it's not people don't look at it like, oh, he has a bad past. I'm telling most people are gonna say, Oh, look what God did for him. Yes. And when they say, look what God did for him, and when we start telling our past, we start telling our lies, we start telling our, our guilt and our shame and all that stuff, that's when the seeds get full. It's when people start coming. It's when we start changing the community, when we start changing our culture, when we start changing people's lives. But if we're hiding it, it's something God gave us. Our failures are something God gave us for a reason. And we have to believe that. Because it is our testimony. It is everything. So don't let Satan try to convince you to hide your past. Hide your past is not the cool thing to do. The prosecutor is done talking. And, and the defense attorney, it's the defense attorney's time to, for, to talk. So our defense attorney is the Holy Spirit. The Paracletos that I talked about earlier. He, was a, he has a very calm demeanor. And he speaks with exceptional clarity and confidence as he comes up and he talks about his Jesus. Here's the thing. So many times we don't talk with exceptional clarity and confidence when we talk about our Jesus. If you're ashamed because you don't know enough, 
I don't know. I don't know how to answer those questions. Maybe you should start reading the Bible a little more. Maybe you need to pick it up a little bit more because the thing is, is that we as Christians should know it. It should be our life. It should be everything to us. So if you're ashamed, it's because you're not as strong as you know you should be. So step up and speak with confidence. Get to know that stuff. And that's one of the reasons why I teach you guys instead of preaching to you guys. Is why I come up here and, and maybe my sermons don't sound like eight nights last week. Maybe I'm not screaming at you and yelling at you. And by the way, blessed are the short-winded, for they shall be called back, right? Amen? So, um, I'll just throw that in there for, for, for fun's sake, if you know about last week. So, but what I'm saying is, what I'm trying to teach you guys is, I'm trying to get you guys to know what you need to know so you can answer confidently. So, if you want me to scream or yell at you or be that kind of preacher, there's some other churches around. <laughs> I'm trying to get you guys to be confident in your knowledge of Christ. I'm trying to teach you guys exactly what you need to know to answer these questions so we can fill our seats, so that we can change lives, change culture, change community. So your prosecutor comes up and he speaks elegantly and clearly. He says, this man, Jesus, who is on trial before you, from the very beginning has been with God. All things have come to be through him. Wow. That's the first line of John. Basically, right? In the beginning was the word. And the word was God. The word was with God. All things have come to be through him. He is the light shining in the darkness. He is the true light which enlightens everyone. He is the word made flesh. He is the father's only son. He is full of grace and truth. The law has been given through Moses, but grace and truth have come through Jesus. No one has ever seen God, but this man, Jesus, has revealed God to us. So, that is exactly what the Holy Spirit was saying in his opening remarks. That he was trying to defend Jesus. And it's basically a paraphrase of John 1 through 8. John 1, 1 through 18. It's the same stuff, because John set it up exactly like a court case. So I'm not going to read that because it's a long portion of scripture, but I challenge you, if you haven't read through John with us, just read John 1 through 18. It's, it's basically John telling us that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is yeah. the deity. So I interrupted you again. Let's go back to the defense attorney. He continues, respected and honorable members of the jury of the court of this trial, I will produce for you a number of witnesses to prove to you beyond any reasonable doubt that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. So with the opening remarks concluded, they go on and the Holy Spirit says, I'm gonna call my first witness. And he calls, if you go through John, <laughs> Because I'm not going to go through John exactly. If you go through John, he calls. First, you see John the Baptist, one of our testimonies. We'll find him later. Then he talks to Andrew and Peter and Philip and Nathaniel or Andrew, both of first John. And we'll hit all those later. But what I wanted to start with, for my sake, for this series' sake, he, um, I wanted to start with just a nobody. A somebody who wasn't a Lazarus that he raised from the dead, or a Peter or somebody who followed him for days, or a John the Baptist who we all know is a huge Bible character, a hero of our faith. I wanted to find somebody who was just like you and I. Not just like you and I. Because the truth is, we're just like the other five I announced. We're just like John the Baptist and Peter. We're all called to our ministry. We all have big things. You are not a nobody. What I'm trying to show you is that there are people in the Bible who are what you think you are. And even they met Jesus and had an encounter with Jesus and have a testimony for God. So we're going to go and we're going to go to John 2. John 2 
John 2, he talks about it. It's his first miracle. And Jesus changes everything here. Let's read. John 2 <coughs> says, On the third day there was a wedding in Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. So we're going we're gonna to find some people in this story as we go on that, that have testimonies. There's actually three of them. There's three people in this circle. There's four, but one of them is a couple. So three or four, whatever you want to say. But right here, I want to point out that Jesus was invited to the wedding. Jesus was invited to the wedding. Jesus was there because he was invited. You can't expect his miracles if you don't have him in your life. Amen. So here, here, you're going to hear their testimony, but I want to tell you that their testimony wasn't anything until they invited him in. You can't expect his miracles if you don't invite him into your life. We can't expect him to make a miracle that we will notice and we won't even notice him. That we can't expect a miracle that we will notice if we won't even give him room in our lives. Do you know who do you know who you invite to your wedding? When I got married, I invited those closest to me. My friends and my family. It wasn't some nobody I met on the side of the road. But it was somebody who meant something to me. That's who you invite to your wedding. Those closest to you. So they invited Jesus because he was probably close to them. People who are important to you go to your wedding. Jesus isn't a genie, guys. I said this last a few weeks ago. He's not something where you rub your little lamp and out pops God and says, what do you need? And you tell him and boom, it's there. That's not Jesus. That's not God. Has he done that? Yeah, he's done that for some of us who have been sinful. But what he wants, he wants us to have a relationship. Yeah. He wants us to be different. He wants us to be close to him. He wants to be close to us. You know, we can't get close to God. We can't, he can't get close to us if we're not close to him. That's right. You can't push him into a lamp until you need him and then pray he comes out. Yeah. Jesus has to be a priority. You have to have to give him Everything. Matthew 22, 37. And he said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. He wants it all. So if you want a testimony, if you want miracles, if you want that stuff in your life, you've got to give him your all. That means you show up to church. That means you find time to pray. That means you read the Bible on a daily basis. You have to invite him into your daily life. That means that you don't stay up late at night because, oh, I don't have to wake up in the morning. I can stay up a few hours watching Netflix. It means that, it means that you still go to bed at that same time and you wake up and you give some time to God in the morning. That's what it means. We've got to give him more than we give him. John Rowan said this. He said, you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Man, think about the people you spend, you spend the most time with. And then think, wow, should I be that person? Okay, and then ask you this. Is Jesus one of the five? Because you're an average of the five. Jesus would really bump up that average. So I'm just saying. He would really bump up that average. But, I mean, really... The five people you spend the most time with, if you're an average of them, then are you happy with that? So, and that doesn't mean that if you spend a lot of time with, with a female, you're going to be talking like, Oh my gosh, I can't believe that. No, it's not like that. You are not going to turn into a woman, but you are going to show her some of her personality traits are going to come through you. Some of the things that she talks about, you're going to start talking about. Some of the things that she likes, you're going to start liking. So, I'm so glad I have my wife as one of my top five. <laughs> because, whew, um, she's changed me a little bit. <laughs> if you have, some of you married men know exactly what I'm talking about. So, you are an average. If Jesus is one of those five, 
then you're 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 gonna go up. But if he's not, you're gonna go down, right? So I ask you this: Is Jesus even in your top twenty? Because many Christians, I think, could say no, and that's sad, right? I said Jesus needs more time in our life. He should be one of those top five that that ups our average of who we are. He has to be invited. Number two, let me read first. It's John 2, 3. It says, when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. So here's the thing. But number two I have for you guys in this story. He was asked. He was asked. I love this part of the story because it kind of shows Jesus' Jesus's humanity, if you will. <laughs> He's like, he, first of all, I don't know what my mom would do if I said, woman! To her at all. <laughs> it must be a culture thing or something because my mom, I think, if I said, woman, go over there, she don't care if I'm preaching. I think my mom might come up and slap me. But my mama didn't like woman and she didn't like mother. She does not like when I call her mother either. She's, that's Mary's name. So, so, but he calls her woman. I don't know, so I don't know if it's a culture, but he tells her it's not time yet. And yet she still pushes him. Just like a human. When, when mama pushes you, you turn up doing it, right? <laughs> like somehow, even if I don't want to do what my mama says, somehow I end up doing it. So Jesus, 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 Mary doesn't even tell Jesus at this point. When Jesus says, it's not my time yet, she's like, I'm not even going to talk to you. Doug, don't make him do that. <laughs> like, she just passed me. She just passed Jesus and told his friends, go make him do it. Go, she told, actually, she told the servants. But... That's the thing. It shows Jesus' humanity a little bit. So, we have to ask, though. If we want Jesus to perform a miracle in our life, if we want our testimony to be better, if we want to be a better witness for Christ, we have to ask. Amen. James 4, 2 tells us, you do not have because you do not ask. Again, I'll tell you that you belong to God. You are his children. You are his Prince, prince and princesses, you are a child of the king. So, if I were to ask my dad, if I know that I'm his dad, I'm his son, if I want something, I can go to him and he'll probably he'll try his best to get it for him. He'll do everything in his in his human possibilities to do it for me. Even now that I'm, oh, I'm almost forty. So <laughs> even now that I'm almost forty, dad will still try to help me. Matthew 7, 11 says, If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask Him? Amen. So, I challenge you guys this. If you're a child of the King, if you are a prince or a princess, up your ask. Up your ask. And that is very, very hard to say. And I was really, really scared to say it. <laughs> up your ask. I, I heard Steve Harvey say, up your ask one time. Up your ask. And I, I have never used it in my sermon because I was always scared I was going to say it wrong. But I said it right. And still I went on a tantrum about saying it wrong. So I'm sorry. But up your ask. Start asking God for big things in your life. Yeah. Start asking God to turn some water into... No, you better not ask God to turn some water into wine. Some of us don't need alcohol in our lives. But start asking God to, to do big things. Start asking God to see miracles in your life. Start asking God for... God answers prayers. He really, really does. And what I've learned, guys... What I've learned since pastoring... Well, I've always known it, but since pastoring... Our Facebook page is taking off, guys. If, uh, we're going to reach 1,600 followers probably this week. We're over 1550 something now. But we have, I have these 13 pastors that, I don't know them from Adam, 
but I've learned to know them through Facebook, through our church page. There's 13 pastors from 13 different nations. Four times, guys, I've had big things happen in my life, and I've sent them a request, and I said, I call them my 13 nations. I said, I'm calling my 13 nations again. Please pray for this. And all four times, we've seen huge, huge miracles. Uh, one of the biggest, I, you guys know my friend Andy Brooks. I've been asking you guys to pray for Andy is walking now. <laughs> like, they literally told him, you're going to die of COVID, and they put him on a ventilator. And two days later, they said, they told his brothers and sisters, you're not going to make it through the night. And then when he woke up, his mind was like crazy cuckoo, and he was seeing things and all kinds of stuff. We prayed for that. His mind is great. And one day, he just woke up and said, they told me that I was fat, and that I was big, and that I couldn't walk. And it was going to take me a long time because I had to relearn because I was on that ventilator for so long. But one day he said, I'm just going to do it now. And he got up and he said, I'm going to be home by my daughter's birthday. And he started walking. He just started walking. And I, I really believe this because of the power of prayer. Prayer changes things up your ask. Amen. So that's number, that, that's number two. Start asking God for big things. Number three. What he does will always surpass what you can do. This is why you up your ask. Verse 6, it says, Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. First of all, y'all know this story. It's going to come to where he's changing his water into wine. I think we don't get that there's six. We think like it's a cup, like it's a bottle or like, like what we think of a wine bottle, maybe. These are 20 to 30 gallons that he does. I don't know how many people were at that wedding, but it was a party. It was a big, big thing. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now became wine, and did not know where it came from. Through the, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. It was better wine than the good wine that they served at the beginning. Jesus wants to give you good things. He wants yes. to do big things. Better than you have. Better than you could have imagined. He wants you to blow your mind when you ask him for things. Like, don't ask him for a new car. Ask him for the exact car you want. Don't, don't say, God, I need a new car. Because he will give you a new car to you. But if you say, God, I want a 2021, I want the, I want no car payment, um, I want someone to say, Lord, uh, send someone that in the church doors right now that will say they will pay my insurance for the next five years. Like, start asking God to do big, big things because he does bigger than you, than you could ever do. So if he could do bigger than you could ever do, then you ask bigger, he's probably going to go bigger than that. That's what God does. God just goes big, 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 big. Like I told you guys earlier, I got promoted. I was happy with being off at 2, I had to go in at 2.30. Like, it was not going to be fun, but I had the raise. I was excited. I get to tell people what to do at work. Yesterday, <laughs> yesterday we had a pod that was going off. Like, they were going crazy, screaming, yelling at officers, all kinds of stuff. And I thought, when I was an officer, I used to say, I wish the sergeant would come in and take everything from them. So yesterday I was like, guys, go in there and take everything from them. You leave them their nightgowns and their blanket and their mattress. That's it. So we took everything. Those people stopped talking. They started behaving. And I, I told Billy this morning, I'm like, Billy, I get to tell people what to do. Like, that is so cool. But, um. I made the decision that I always wanted them to make. And it was, it was so 
fun. But my point is this, is that God just does big, huge things that you could have never even imagined. Um, on my day four of sergeant, and my lieutenant told me yesterday, she said, if any of my sergeants are going to make lieutenant, it's you. I said, I'm on day four. Are you kidding? And she said, no, I'm serious. They were mad, the other four sergeants, but I was mad. Anyway, God is so good. God, God always gives us bigger than we ask. And he did in this story. It was better wine than they had at the beginning. But this story ends with verse 11. It says, this is the first of his signs. Jesus did at Cana and Galilee and manifested his glory. And his disciples believed in him. His disciples believed. These are people who are following him already. They already knew him. They were already labeled disciples. But it wasn't until a miracle came that John says they believed. That's why I told you guys earlier, your testimony is so big. It's so real. It changes lives. Start telling people what God has done for you. Start telling them. And tell it right. Like, don't leave nothing out. Because, like, I think sometimes I talk about how we think it's a wine bottle. Like, make sure you tell people that it was, like, with six 30-gallon jugs. Like, say the whole thing because it shows you how, it shows others how big your God is. His disciples believed. So then next, that's why next week we're going to go into the disciples and John the Baptist, which... Actually, if you read John or before this, I already mentioned that to you guys. But So we're going to go into his disciples now. But it was somebody who just invited Jesus to their wedding that got the disciples to believe somehow. It's just somebody who invited them to their wedding. So you guys, just be that person that just invites someone to church. That just invites someone somewhere. And you know, I don't always invite people to our church. Like, if they don't live by us, I will tell them, there's a church by you, it's down the road, and this pastor's a really good guy. Guys, it's not about filling these seats, it's about filling church seats. Right. It's about getting people to Jesus. Yes, amen. I, I may, honestly, we live way out here in Buckeye, like 10 buck two. But, uh, so, I know that some of my coworkers may live in Goodyear. I may have invited more people to my friend's church in Goodyear than I have here. But that is fine. He's a really good pastor and he's going to get them the right stuff they need. It is fine. But we have to. We have to share our testimony. We have to build Christ. We have to let people know what he's doing in our lives. This story right here it impacted three Four different people. It impacted the head waiter. It impacted the servants who the head waiter sent to go get the water. It impacted the, the bride and the groom. All because Mary asked. She just asked. Their testimony was built because she asked. So here's the thing. I think uh, another thing I want to give you guys, and we're going to kind of close here. Is, that wine may not have been for Mary. Mary didn't say, I want, I want, more, I want more alcohol. I need to get drunk. Can Jesus give me some more wine? She asked for everybody at the wedding. She asked for everybody. So don't be, I think too many times that we get stuck up on ourselves. It's all about me. It's all about me. Guys, it's not all about you. So when you up your ask, up your ask for others too. Ask for God to do big things in other people's lives. It's not just us. It's not just our church, but it's, it's everyone. And we want to change a community. We can't just pray that God changes our church. We have to pray that God changes the community. So when you see someone at the grocery store that doesn't look exactly happy, you don't have to be like, let me tell you about my Jesus. He changed my life. And he's so great and so big. 
And you don't have to sound like that witness guy that you were like freaked out by when you were 15. Like you can just say, you know what, you don't look happy. Is there something I can pray for? You don't have to say, can I pray for you right now and go crazy in tongues? You don't have to do that. It is okay to calm down a little bit and just be like, can I pray for you? I promise you, if you start doing that, just that little thing, uh, maybe in a year or two years, you'll be that crazy guy. <laughs> That's okay. But you got to start somewhere. And you'll have no problem being that crazy guy later if you start with something little now. So there's... So their testimony has not only changed the people at the wedding, but it's changed all of us in here. And most Christians in every church have read this story. I started talking about the legacy that these women have on me, but we all have a legacy. We all have a legacy, and our legacy is our testimony. When we're long gone, it's our legacy, those that we've led to Christ, that will still be here changing the world. It's our kids and those who we've won to Jesus, those who we stopped by at the store and prayed for, and then they thought, you know what, Christians might not be that bad. I'm gonna go to church this week. That's our latest. That's what we need. So we're gonna pray and I'll take communion. Father, we love you, Lord, and we thank you, Father, for just being a God who does big, big things for us, Father. A God who produces testimonies out of willing vessels, Father God. And Lord, we just pray, God, that you continue, Lord, to move in our lives, Lord, and you help us become, Lord, vessels that speak, Father. Vessels that go out and, and ask people and tell people about you and just do little things, Father, because we, we know that our little things you can make big. Father, so we just pray that, Father, you... Just grow this church, Father. Grow this community. Change lives. Change people. Change testimonies, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. Sorry, Lord Jason. Jason. So we're going to take communion. We, we always take communion. Actually, I didn't learn this from these two ladies. And that's crazy because um, everything I've done about church, everything I've always done has been something I learned from from that, 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 that age group, that time frame in the Pentecostal Church of God. But when I learned this from the pastor I spent a little bit of time with in, in Goodyear, and we only spent six months with him, but I learned that, that Jesus is everything. He is everything. But when you dig through the Bible, sometimes Jesus doesn't come up in your message. He may be teaching about Time, or you may be teaching about something that just Jesus didn't really come up. Well, we take communion because no matter what I talk about, no matter what we what what happens in our service, we always end on the note that Jesus is everything, that Jesus is real, and we take this to remind us that for the whole week. And I challenge you guys that sometimes when you're eating dinner, maybe all by yourself, and you have a Dorito and a cup of water, like pray. And say, and just think about Jesus. Like, this, this could be your body, this could be your blood, but I'm so thankful for it. Like, it's not a cracker, and it's not grape juice, but Jesus knows, and you know. It reminds you of him. And when you're reminded of him, you act more like him. So, we always close trying to remind you guys that Jesus is, is everything. That Jesus is all. You can come up there. That Jesus is everything, that Jesus is all. And I put my grape juice somewhere. So, the body. Sometimes we think that we're all tattered and we're all torn up, that we're nothing. And we look at our past and we look at our failures and we think, God can't do nothing with me. Look at Jesus on the cross and see how tattered and torn up and beat up he was. And God changed the world with that. His body was everything. You are who you are because that tattered body on the cross. And when you show your testimony, 
people can be who they are because of your tragic lives, your torn turn up lives. So for that, I know my life was all messed up. There was a time in my life when people would call me white and I would hit them. I was so racist against my own race. I would beat people up and yell at them. I'm black. I play basketball. That was so stupid. I was a little kid. But, I mean, I was messed up in the head. I was really messed up. And God took me and just changed me. And he'll take you and change you. God, and you can become somebody. You can become something. You can change lives. God takes tattered bodies, tattered people, and changes lives. So if you're in that with me, and you will need that. Let's take the breath. God reminds us that we don't have to worry. We don't have to worry about what we've done. But we start a new week knowing that we're, we're clean, we're free. The blood is what cleanses our sins. So we always start our week thinking that Jesus cleansed me, I'm new. And I pray that you guys remember that all week long. But it is so nice for me on a weekly basis drink this juice and remember that for me to say because sometimes in our lives go and sometimes we have rough I had a really really rough day at work yesterday and I didn't think about Jesus sometimes sometimes I was worried about other stuff sometimes we forget about that but I think as a weekly reminder and as I told you guys do it when you can that he forgives us that he, I'm free that when I make bad decisions, I'm okay. The blood. The blood. I'm so thankful. And it doesn't work. Like, take the blood and pour it on Jason's white shirt. And it's not going to be clean. But God does miracles. He took blood and made it clean things. He's a magic eraser. I'm so thankful for the blood. Let's see. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you, Lord, for your blood and more for your body. Lord, the, the, the pain you took on the cross for us, Father. I thank you for all that you're doing in all of our lives, Father God. It is you who makes us us, Father. It is you who took us from what we were and brought light into us, Father. It is your light that we are running to, Father. It is you who we want to become. We want to be more like you. Paul says that we should be imitators of you, Lord. It's your blood and your body that was torn on the cross that has led us to the point that we want to be more like you. And we are so thankful, Lord. Let us always remember that as we go through our week, Father. Lord, put a hedge of protection around each and every one of us as we go home today, Father. Help us make right decisions in our life as we uh, as we approach things that you led us to this week, Father. And just be with us all. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Thanks for being here, guys. Love you all.